Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Glenridge Bible Church. If you're visiting, it's great to have you here. Uh, some announcements we want to touch on. We are now officially into the Christmas season, whether you like it or not, whether you're ready or not. We are here, and that uh, that'll kick off tonight with Seasons Chorale. So we have a 72-person choir and a seven-piece brass that will be here this evening to lead us in a night of worship. There'll be a lot of Christmas carols and a number of unique songs that will go through the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're able to, please be here. Doors will open at 6. Concert begins at 6.30. So do, do, please come. Because they, we had them here at Easter time. This place was packed. And so I hope, uh, hope you guys will be here this evening. Um, on the back of your bulletin, there's a number of events that are going on. And really, you know, it's, it's that busy time, so you want to take note. You don't have to attend everything. It's okay to say no to some things. But if you're able to, you know, try and attend some of the events that we have going on here. Uh, right after the service, we have safe place refresher training for anyone who needs that. We will be meeting downstairs in the common room. If you don't know how to get there, I'll draw you a map. It's just downstairs. Just go down any of the stairs. You'll see us down there if you've never been down there. And so that'll be today. And again, as I mentioned, uh, tonight will be Seasons Corral. This Friday, November 29th, we have a very special event. Uh, here we are hosting the Niagara Home Educators Association Handmade Market. So the NIA Handmade Market. Uh, you got this craft sale. My kids are there. There's a number of kids you might recognize that will be there. They'll be in the gym. That runs from 1 till 4. I believe last year when we were across the street, there was even things like chili and soup for sale, and it's all fundraisers for the kids. So that's Nia. So we're very, very pleased to host that this Friday. Uh, the following day on Saturday, if you have not registered, please do so. Uh, at the end of the service at 1.30, there's the ladies' Christmas tea. So that'll be, I, I would imagine they're having tea. I, I don't know. I've never been to a ladies' Christmas tea, so I can't speak to that end. But it sure sounds like it. And I'm sure there'll be some, uh, some delicious treats there as well. So that's at 1.30. And there's a, there is a program that will be involved there. Uh, next uh, Sunday, we will have our monthly family potluck. Any information for that is, is on the info table. Uh, Sunday, December 1st, uh, in the evening, we will have our carol sing at 6.30, so our yearly carol sing here at the church. Monday, December 2nd, anyone who's interested can join me, Dominic, Gloria, and the rest of the Monday night Bible study crew and prayer meeting crew. We'll be across the street from 5.30 to 6.30 singing Christmas carols to the folks there. And again, another special event that's coming up, take note of that, Thursday, December 5th, uh, sort of an offshoot of NIA, the Niagara Home Educators Association, there's the Jubal Cottage School Christmas Concert. And so we will be blessed. That is a Thursday evening at 7 o'clock sharp. Uh, it's quite a performance. And again, we're very pleased to host that here at Glen Ridge Bible Church. And there is also a Henley coming up December 8th. And on and on the list goes. So take note of all those exciting events. Take a deep breath. We are well into the Christmas season. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to be here this morning. It is good to gather together in the house of the Lord, in the unity of the Spirit. We pray. We pray now that you would just continue to bless us with your presence. We pray that all that we would do would be honoring to you. We want to lift up all of these events according to your will, Lord, that they would be pleasing in your sight and that they would declare with majesty and authority the name of Jesus, the reason, of course, for the Christmas season. Bless our service, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Uh, how many here have ever heard anybody say, sing to an audience of one? Hands up. Some of you have not. I can't, it, well, good. Some of you have. I was going to ask you, what does that mean? So those of you who have never heard that, you can think about it, because that's exactly what we're going to do right now with our opening hymn. It is a prayer. It is a prayer. It's a great prayer but we're singing it to an audience of one. So that's why it gives instructions. Sing in unison, be at one here, and sing the heart intent, and let's do this as we begin our service. If you're able, please stand with me. We're going to sing this prayer, Be Thou My Vision. The hymn book number is 382. Let's sing it together. Sleep. 
verse this morning is from Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40. And he, being the Lord Jesus Christ, said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Our loving Father, we come into your holy presence this morning to worship you and you alone. The God among gods, the King among kings, the creator, the sustainer, and the author and finisher of our faith. We thank you now for the giving of your beloved Son. We thank you that we have access into the holiest of holies, into the very throne room, into the presence of the God whose, whose robe, as in the vision of Isaiah, filled the entire throne room of heaven, whose, whose presence that, that men quake at, the one who, who is the sustainer of all life. Father, we thank you now that we can come in humility to praise you and you alone. May this morning, this act of worship, this church service, and be an offering worthy of the name of Christ. For his name we pray, amen.
Come on up. Kids, I'll get you to come up as well because it's at Christmas time where we're all like children, especially us six foot six guys. Come on up, guys. Don't be shy. Funny just has some words she wants to share. She has a very long, long, uh, <laughs> long list of thanks. Thank you. No, I, uh, I really am grateful for all of you who came out this week and helped me with the shoeboxes. We um, had so many that it was almost overwhelming at some point. Officially, the, close up, the closing date and hour was yesterday, but now I found out last night there's still going to be 150 boxes coming in this afternoon at around 1. So if you're bored and want to give a hand, feel free to come at 1 o'clock. And um, yeah, very thankful, very thankful for all your help. So far, we have collected 2,371 boxes. Uh, that is uh, including boxes that came from Grimsby. As I said, we can add another 150 to that this afternoon. I'm going to ask Pastor Bobby now to pray over the boxes. Pray with us, please, because it's important that these boxes go to the right children. Thank you. Thank you, Fidey. If you're able to, if we could hold hands, if you're comfortable in the congregation, uh, stand, please, and we'll hold hands and, and pray God's blessing on these boxes. Very simple things, very simple items, but it's oftentimes in the simple things of life that the gospel is expressed so clearly. A loving Father, we thank you again for the work of Jesus Christ. We thank you again for the cross. We thank you again that we hear the words of the Lord. It is finished. We thank you for the glory of the gospel. We thank you that he is alive at your right hand and one day is very soon going to return for his bride, for his church. Father, we thank you that we are all by faith, our names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, called the Bride of Christ. But Lord, there are many who are outside the commonwealth of the faith. And how can they know unless they hear? And so we pray now as these boxes, these, these simple things of life, Simple things like soap and, and a face cloth and a toothbrush. These things that we take for granted. Father, we pray that you would pour out your peace and your grace and your blessing and the power of the gospel in each and every single one of them that have been collected from around the world. And as they make their way out into areas unknown to us, we do not know who is going to receive these boxes. But we do know that you will undertake all of these things that you have a destiny for each and every single one of these, and we pray that your spirit would accompany each box into the lives of these children, and they would know Christ as their Savior. Father, we thank you for the Christmas season when the creator of the world became a child himself. And so we want to pray for these children that will receive these boxes, that they would be blessed. For your sake we pray. Amen. Thank you. Let's give everyone a round of applause here that chip, chipped in. Thank you. you. May be seated, guys. It was quite encouraging. I think it was. I think it was uh, a Thursday morning. I could be, I believe it was Thursday morning when there was a team here and about 500 or so boxes came in and Fighty came into my office and said, help. And so it was a great joy to, to serve in that way and to see all the work that the OCC team has done over the week. I also want to give a special thank you to our decorating committee. As you can see, we have Christmas-fied the platform, so let's give them a big round of applause. You never really see the unity of the spirit more than when you have a bunch of ladies decorating together. It's a beautiful thing. I was, I was in charge of the tall tree, not bad, eh? First person that says the star is crooked. 
Well, let's open up our Bibles. We're going to end this series in the Sermon on the Mount. We're in uh, Matthew chapter 7 before we transition into our Advent season next Sunday, Lord willing. And we're going to finish off this idea of the golden rule. So if you're able to, please stand. We're in Matthew chapter 1. We will reread verses 1 to 6 because they do give us the context of verses 7 to 12. Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. We will focus on verses 7 to 12 this morning. Do not judge so that you will not be judged, for in the same way you judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look in the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs. Do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish... He will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Our loving Father, again, we thank you for this opportunity to meet together here. We thank you again for the fellowship of the saints. We thank you for those who are visiting here this morning and for those who have long uh, been members of Glen Ridge Bible Church. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who gives us understanding. And Lord, I would pray now that Christ be magnified and that the words I share this morning would be honoring to you, honoring to your word, and would be a blessing to each of us as we are transformed more and more into the image of your beloved Son. I pray again the blessing on the reading, the public reading of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. You know, there are a lot of verses in life, in day-to-day life, that I quote. Uh, For certain reasons, at certain times, they've ministered to me. I've memorized Romans 5 and 8, of course, one of my most favorite verses of the Bible. But God demonstrated his own love toward us. And now while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. During times of trial and testing and temptation, what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, No temptation has overtaken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you may be able to endure it. And the very famous and often quoted Awana verse, no, not approved workmen are not ashamed. No, no, no. John 11 and 35, when a kid desperately needs to pass a section, he only needs to do one verse, the favorite verse, Jesus wept. Bang. But there is no other verse that I quote, especially to my loving children, more than verse 12. Treat others the way you want to be treated. And I'm sure they're probably embarrassed, but in the back of their head, yeah, dad, dad, dad does say that a lot, doesn't he? With those few words, what they describe here is the truest and purest test and measure of gospel love. This is the positive, this is the active, this is the expressive side of love that extends from a regenerated life in Christ. William Barclay said this, and I quote, This one verse, which serves as the great conclusion to the main theme of the Sermon on the Mount, presents the demonstrative life and love and liberty of anyone who belongs to the kingdom of heaven and has been described as the Mount Everest of ethics. End quote. The Lord has given his listeners standards for kingdom living, teachings that relate to ourselves, uh, relate to the Lord, how we relate with material possessions, understanding pure undefiled religion, the importance of interpersonal relationships within his church. And now in verses 7 to 12, this will be the summation of all those principles Now, after stripping away the loveless self-righteousness that defined the Pharisees, 
and careless critiques of those with critical spirits, and the arrogant and puffed up pride that characterized the scribes and the Pharisees, Jesus now will instruct us on how to love others the way God wants us to love them. Question one in your sermon outline of verses like Matthew 5.20, Matthew 6, 1 to 2, and 6 and 5 describe the negative attributes of the codified, self-manufactured, self-righteous, man-made religion of the Pharisees. And verses 7 to 12 present the positive side of Jesus' teaching on the kingdom of heaven. You have the negative and the positive. And that's what makes this seemingly disjointed part of the text connect to the larger work of the Sermon on the Mount. These verses are the perfect bridge between the negative teaching of unfairly judging others and the need to be discerning in our actions, interactions with others and, and, and moves his listeners onto the positive side of the golden rule, so to speak, in verse 12. It begins with the continuing theme of discernment found in last week's verses. If we are called, loved ones, to be kind and to be merciful and to be forgiving, always remembering the grace and mercy and forgiveness we have received from the Lord, but also need to balance that with being wise and discerning and being on guard for any of those who might harm the church, to judge while not being judgmental and be observant enough to know uh, to see the true character of the brethren and deal with criticisms in the church accordingly in a godly way that fosters spiritual unity, we are going to need an essential ingredient. We are going to need the type of wisdom that is only available to believers, to the regenerated, to those who have put their faith and trust in Christ, who are in Christ, who are, we might say, saved, those who are saved. That's the everyone who asks in verse uh, 8. For everyone who asks and receives in verse 8. That's who Jesus is talking about there. His people. God's people. Those who ask, those who seek, those who knock, those who ex will experience those answers and will receive God's equipping. They are not unbelievers. That is not available for them in the context of what Jesus is describing here. Because this is not a universal promise. This is not a blank check for anyone and everyone. Because within this context, this is a promise that's directed toward his people through faith in Christ. Because that's who Jesus is speaking to. Then and now. You're looking at question two now. That's the direct context. If we are going to fulfill the instructions Christ has laid out in the Sermon on the Mount thus far, especially verses 1 to 6 of chapter 7, knowing when to confront sin in a loving way that recognizes our own frailties, when to engage in evangelism, when to back off. We looked at that last week with the dogs and the swine and being discerning when we share, when we evangelize. We're going to need the wisdom of God. If we're going to be successful, have any measure of success, we're going to need the wisdom of God, who James promises us we will receive. That's our supportive text, James 1 and 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men generously and without report, reproach, and it will be given to him, especially those who belong to the household of God. Along with his word, God's desire is that we seek him out personally, that we rely on him. And through his spirit in harmony with the Bible, basking in the fellowship we have with the Father, we can know that he will give us the knowledge to fulfill his word and his will. Especially when we encounter situations like the one Jesus explicitly describes in verses 1 to 6. Basically what Jesus is promising us is that when we need wisdom, when we encounter these situations, when we want to know how to properly handle a situation where the Lord has positioned us, whether it's to lovingly confront sin in a brother or a sister, again from a place of humility and love, recognizing our own tendency to fail, to fall, to sin, or when we need that heavenly wisdom to discern absolute truth from almost true, that's the key. It's never so much truth and lie, it's always truth and what seems almost like the truth, the counterfeit, to discern between false doctrine and apostasy. Jesus instructs us, this is what you do. You go to the Father. 
you ask, you seek, you knock. And those all mean, of course, pray. Seek and knock are metaphors for prayer in verse 7. This indicates our need, loved ones, to go to God in humility and with an awareness, a spiritually illuminated awareness of our frailty and our needs. The same way a small child comes to their earthly father or earthly mother when they need help and are unable to do something. My children are very quickly and rapidly growing, and all of a sudden they seem to be, th- they're in charge of the house now, apparently. Laura and I are just so excited for the old folks' home that they're going to stick us in, in next week. But I remember as small children, they would come and they would ask for help with the most simple task, like tying their shoes. And now they're offering to read something for me on a bottle because I can't see it. Or the circle of life. Well, in the same way as a small child, we're told to continually pursue God, to seek Him, to ask Him for help. Now, we're told to continually knock, continually ask, continually seek. Even when it seems like our prayers are bouncing off the gates of heaven, Jesus says, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. This is one of the greatest comprehensive promises to us, to his church. That anyone here this morning that belongs to Christ, we have an eternal and unlimited promise that the Father will meet our needs. And and amazingly enough, one of our elders in our elders meeting this past week prayed, giving thanks that God is so gracious, he even sometimes meets our wants. But that's not, the, that's not the focus here. The focus is the needs of discernment, the need of wisdom, the need of, 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 of fostering unity within the body of Christ. That anyone here that belongs to him, we know that uh, that, that promise is for us. And the incredible thing is, we can never exhaust that. We can never diminish the divine resource from where it comes from. We cannot wear it out or fatigue the Lord, or overtax him when we continually seek his wisdom. My children, when they were younger, yes, there were times where it was just a perpetual ask, a perpetual ask, and constant assistance. And sometimes they'd be like, I had enough, go ask your mom. The Father's not like that. We are called to keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. You cannot exhaust him. It's a great promise for each of us that everyone who belongs to God through faith in Christ, will have their prayers answered. You will have your prayer answered if you pray in faith. Now, it might be a yes, it might be a no, and it might be the very dreaded wait. But the Lord will answer. He hears the prayers of a righteous man, and you are made righteous through Christ's righteousness. And that's not a promise for some of us. That's not just for the religiously elite. That's not just for the elders. That's not just for the pastor. That's not for the popular, that's not for the highly educated. But it's for all of us who faithfully and diligently and persistently seek him out. Every believer's prayer will be heard and will be answered according to his will. Those for us who continually ask and seek and knock. So question three, what it really means is is this, this keep asking. It's an ongoing ask. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. That's what the original Greek is communicating. And not because God's playing hardball with us, but but he does instruct us to ask and to seek and to knock, to keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, because he is determined in his divine will to cultivate a relationship with each of his people. It is a persistence in dependence that he's developing in us. Abandoning our sinful, sinful sense of independence and and casting ourselves on his grace and provisions of divine wisdom. In order to illustrate the certainty of verses 7 to 8, Jesus used an example from our own human experiences, a loving parent. Now, I want to acknowledge that not everyone has experienced that in their life. Not everyone has experienced the gracious love of a parent. I want to acknowledge that. But God's design has always been that parents lovingly provide, protect, for the needs of their children, as imperfect as that might be, and it is imperfect. And the majority of his listeners would have known that. They would have recognized the, 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 God, the, the, the ordained position of a parent to provide, to protect for their children. 
And in that example, as imperfect as it is, he's going to show something of what God's love looks like, asking two rhetorical questions in verses 9 to 10. What man among you, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he's asking for lunch, he's hungry. You will give him a snake. You won't give him a snake, will you? The obvious answer is no one. No truly caring and loving father or mother who has embraced that divinely established role would intentionally deceive their own child. No genuine, loving, godly father would administer that type of cruelty, providing a stone that looked like a loaf of bread. No parent would give their child a snake to cook like it's, an ordin- like it's some, type of, just some type of ordinary meat. Because it wasn't. It was, as a matter of fact, Jesus is emphasizing the love of a parent here and because the, the snake was classified as an unclean animal. It wasn't supposed to be eaten by the Jews. You find that back in Leviticus 11 and 12. A loving father, the extension of that is, wouldn't intentionally dishonor and defile his own son by breaking the commandments of God, would they? Even in their imperfect love. In Luke's gospel, in Luke 11 and 12, there's another added illustration. A scorpion being substituted for an egg. And some scorpions in in the Near East actually resembled an egg when they were curled up to sleep. So there was, a, there was a familiarity with that example. You know, the most selfless relationship among humankind is supposed to be that of parents and their children. It's supposed to be. As a parent, there isn't anything I wouldn't sacrifice for my children. Nothing I would hold back. Parents are more likely to sacrifice for our own children than anyone else, to be honest. Even to the point where we'd lay down our own lives for them. I know I would in a heartbeat. So I hope that influences their decision in whatever home they stick me in one day. And it's interesting that the parent-child relationship, how if we truly love our kids, we will want them to be more successful than we were. We want them to be financially more secure than we were. We want them to be more emotionally established than we were. Of course, we would want them to grow spiritually far beyond what we have reached. So as sinful fathers, generally speaking, if we know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? If the lesser is true, that is, as sinful and as as as, as deficient as my love is, if that's true that I would give my life for my child, how much more will God give us, whose love is perfect, who is holy? The lesser is true if earthly fathers who are sinful and tainted by this fallen nature would give their child what they need, how much more will the greater be true? The love, the care, the response of our Heavenly Father to meet our needs, again in context, wisdom, and discernment, and how to engage in evangelism, how to foster godly relationships within the church. These illustrations describe so much more than we might realize. I'd like to quote R.T. France. Quote, human parents, even at their best, are bad, quote unquote, in comparison with the Heavenly Father. And the adjective forms an effective contrast with the good, good things, which even they will give to their children. The gifts of a holy good father must therefore be even more truly good, end quote. So by contrasting the imperfect love of an earthly father to our heavenly father, Jesus is declaring the limitless love and mercy, goodness, provision, wisdom, God has available for his people if they ask. Keep asking. There's no limit to the spiritual blessings Paul writes about in Ephesians 1 and 3 the Lord offers us. And if our Father treats us with that kind of love and generosity, now here's the flip, here's the switch, here's the rub. Shouldn't we extend that to others? That's the rub. Shouldn't we extend that type of love and care and compassion, willingness to sacrifice for others with those who have the same indwelling Holy Spirit? 
Shouldn't we treat others the way the Father has treated us? Providing for us. Caring for us. Treating us with the imago Dei dignity. Showing forgiveness. On and on the list goes. Therefore, as Jesus draws the Sermon on the Mount to a close, he makes this commanding statement in verse 12. In everything, therefore... Treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. In one explicit verse, Jesus sums up the perfect love of the Father and how it must be reflected in his children toward one another. Treat others as they themselves wish to be treated. And the Lord has given an example of how we have been treated by God. And if that's our desire, then that must be projected on those around us. Now, this isn't some lofty ethical standard. This isn't some type of habitual practice or whatever it is. This is the demonstrative reality of God's children living in the ongoing presence of God's perfect love, which draws on the divine power of the kingdom of heaven. That unbeliever cannot do that. The unbeliever cannot access that. Question four, now how you treat others, how you treat others isn't a means of salvation. It's not a means of salvation. That's works oriented. Instead, it's a crystallized precept, a crystallized precept of the Bible's entire message. It is a love and a treatment of others that is grounded in the gospel and summarizes the essence of God's will for his people in the Old Testament, which Jesus refers to as the law and the prophets. And now for all of his disciples, into the age of grace. It is, in a sense, a rule, for lack of a better term, in a way that regulates all the other laws of Scripture. How to love others. Enemies, yes, of course. Very difficult to do. But I would argue it's even more difficult to love those who are part of the household of God at times. Question five, one sobering thought about the golden rule is that how we treat others, how we treat others is a reflection, loved ones. It's a reflection of our own relationship with God and how we value others. Isn't it interesting to note who was led by the Holy Spirit to pen these words? Who wrote this gospel? Say it out loud. Who? No, his name wasn't George. Matthew. What was his other name? Levi. And what was his occupation? Oh, those well-loved tax collectors. Who doesn't love the IRS or Canada Revenue? They, unfortunately, it seems like in every generation, they're the subject of scorn and animosity. Matthew was no different. In the New Testament, the tax collector was generally hated by the public, especially a turncoat Jew like Matthew. They were hated by the Jews because they worked for the Romans. They were traitors. They were publicans who enriched their own lives at the expense of the Jewish brethren. They were hated because tax collectors didn't value anyone but themselves. And the only value they estimated in others was the amount of taxes they could squeeze out of them. They were hated because they would skim off the top. Everybody knew it. They would cheat the people they collected from. Men like Zacchaeus, for example who admitted his dishonesty in Luke's gospel, 19 verse 8, and men like Levi here, the son of Alphaeus, uh, uh, we know as the apostle Matthew, were some of those unpopular uh, individuals. So, So before Matthew was called to follow Jesus, he probably considered compassion and the dignified treatment of others to be a worthless practice, a worthless investment. And a commandment like treat others the way you want to be treated would have been completely alien to him. And largely speaking, question, this is our next question, that's mankind's problem. We're all kind of like tax collectors. We're narcissistic. We're selfish. We're unwilling to sacrifice for others. We measure the gain on the return, right? What do we give out, we expect in return. That's because the unregenerated person cannot love others as we love ourselves or treat others the way we would like to be treated because the power to live like that can only come from Jesus. And that's, that's evident in the lives of these two men, in Matthew and Zacchaeus, for example. When they met Jesus, they were changed. 
They were liberated and began to see their brethren from eternal perspective. They began to see humanity through the eyes of God. And essentially records for us that God is our pattern. And the way the Lord treats us is the standard by which we must treat one another. It is the benchmark for our relationships with one another. It has been expressed throughout history in lots of other religions and philosophies. But it has always been expressed negatively. That's question seven. It's always been expressed in other religions negatively. I'll give you three examples. Confucius taught, what you do not want done to yourself, do not do to others. So it's negative. It's a negative presentation. There was a Jewish rabbi that famously said, what is hateful to yourself, do not to someone else. Do not to someone else. There's an ancient Greek king who wrote, do not do to others the things which make you angry when you experience them at the hands of other people. Now all these statements, they are not expressions of love. They are motivated by fear and self-preservation. They are expressed negatively. And that's as far as unredeemed man can go. But here, here, in the pages of Scripture, from the, words of our, from, from the mouth of our Lord, the divine truth is communicated by Jesus positively. It's in a way revolutionary. And the Lord connects it to the Old Testament when he summarizes the entire Hebrew Bible down to this, for this is the law and the prophets. Later on in the gospel, Jesus would be asked what the greatest commandment in the law is, and Jesus would reply, which was our key verse this morning, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, all your strength. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. It is the foundation of our faith. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. Matthew chapter 22. The whole point is this, as we come to a close. When we practice the so-called golden rule, it must be lived in conjunction with the greatest commandment. Love God. It is the outgrowth of our discipleship to Christ. Question 8, it is the core expression, the core expression of a life that loves God. Remember, it is a reflection. It is a reflection of your own relationship with the Lord, how you treat others, how you speak to others. It is the core expression of a life that loves God, which in turn loves others. And the love we have for God, by which he first loved us, 1 John 4, 19, that love enables us to love and to do unto others what we would have them done to us. And the basis for how to treat others the way you want to be treated is how God treated us. That's the standard. You want to know how to treat others? You take a journey by faith to the cross, and you see how we were treated. All guilty, all criminals, all broke God's law. And God did not cast us off. The Father did not reject us. He did not just blink everyone out of existence. It would have been his divine right as the creator. He has every right to do so. But instead, he loved us to the point that he gave his son. That is the whip, the height, the depth of God's love. And if that's the basis, if that's the foundation, if that's the demonstrative example of treating others. And that's the basis for us. That's the standard. Question nine is, you don't know how to treat others the way you want to be treated? Then you recall how God knows what's best for us as a father does for his children. And that is how he has acted toward us. He has showered us with mercy. And so if we have received that, if that's the desire of our heart, to receive God's mercy. If that's how we want to be treated, loved ones, now we must treat others with mercy. If we come to God and ask for his forgiveness, because, loved ones, each and every single person in this room, we have to continually seek God's forgiveness when we stumble during the day. Not not for our salvation to be renewed or some sense that I'm lost because I, 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 I sinned. No, no. That salvific issue is dealt with when you put your faith and trust in Christ. But like dirty feet, the Apostle Peter, we need that constant forgiveness, that constant cleansing that comes from the Lord. If we come to the Father and ask for forgiveness, we have to forgive others. If that's the desire of our heart, to be forgiven, then we must forgive others. 
dedication and the way the Lord has dedicated himself to us by pouring his Holy Spirit into us, if we want to have those around us dedicate their lives to us, we must then dedicate our lives to them in service toward one another because the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve. Emmanuel. And he came to serve even to the point of laying down his life for others. Whether we receive that service or not, we serve because we know we have been served by the Master. And so consider all the ways that God has treated you. Consider all the ways he has poured out his mercy, his grace, his forgiveness, because that should be the desire of our hearts. That God has not treated us according to his righteous standard. He has every right to judge us, to cast us off, but he poured that judgment on Christ. And so if it's our desire to receive that forgiveness, to receive that mercy, to receive his provision, to receive his power, to receive his grace, to receive his compassion, to receive his love, the list goes on, then we must, that is the standard, we must treat others in the same exact way. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you again for this time that we were able to spend with the Lord Jesus during his famous Sermon on the Mount. We thank you for the great teaching there, the perfect teaching of Christ. Father, I pray where I have failed this morning, the Holy Spirit would clarify and give meaning to what was said by Jesus though many years ago. I pray now that we would act out, that we would demonstrate the truths of Scripture, that we would, as simple as it is, Lord, as simple as it is, we're, we just fail so often but to treat others the way we wish to be treated, to treat others the way we have been treated by our loving Father. So help us, equip us by your Spirit to live a life that is honoring to this commandment by our Lord. In his name we pray, amen. Our hymn of response is found on page number 387. It's a prayer. Oh, to be like thee. And uh, that's the good news of the gospel as well, is that uh, he completes the work that he starts, and he's there willing to help us in our weakness. Well, won't you stand with me if you are able, and we'll sing this as our closing hymn.
So again, just a quick note that if you are taking safe place, the refresher will be downstairs following the service. Uh, if there's anybody who's available to help set out chairs, we need to set out about 72 chairs on the platform here um, to get ready for the concert tonight. Again, the concert starts at 6.30. I hope you're able to attend. And um, I know that I was really convicted by this message this week and the simplicity of that commandment of loving others and treating others the way that I want to be treated, and yet we so often fall short of that. I'm just so thankful for God's grace this morning. And so let's really make an effort, a concentrated effort by His Spirit to love one another the way the Father has loved us. Let's pray. Again, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. We thank you again for the indwelling Holy Spirit. We thank you for the understanding that He brings. We thank you again for His leading. And Father, we again just thank you so much for the peace that surpasses all understanding by knowing Christ as our own Lord and Savior. Thank you for the congregation here this morning and all those who could be here under the sound of your word. I pray it was a blessing to them. And again, Lord, where I have faltered or failed, I pray that your Holy Spirit would minister in ways. And so, Lord, now I pray your benediction and your blessing upon this congregation as we head out today. And all the events that we partake in, Lord, we pray that all will be done according to your mercy, your will, and would be pleasing in your sight. Father, I pray your face would shine upon us as we make our way back out into the world as lights of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.